This is a special week. I got together with pastors, mostly Alliance pastors from the greater Toronto area, and we just all felt to pray, pray for each other's churches, especially during this time where there's, uh, where there's something in the air, where people are receptive to the gospel, maybe more than any other time of the year. So join us in prayer, if you would. For the last two weeks, we've been in this series on grace, this, this word, this idea that we, we've got to get right. Uh, it's just too important not to. And we start off with a look at what grace is. It's this gift from God, a gift of forgiveness and restored relationship. And even in the face of our own sin and how it's just freely given, totally undeserved, that it's not something we earn or work for. It's not about what we do ourselves, but what's been done for us. And there was even an opportunity to receive that grace, the, the gift of salvation. And then last week we looked at how we're not just to receive that gift and sort of hide it, but, but we're actually to live under that grace for our lives and to give it freely to others, to be grace givers, not stone throwers. Jesus shows us not only in this story of a woman caught in adultery, but in every one of his interactions, that grace is not only to be received, but extended to others. And might I add to ourselves, I, 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 someone, someone needs to extend grace to themselves this morning. The well of God's grace is, is bottomless. And uh, it's for us every day of our life. And because of that, we should show it to others every day of our life. Every step of our journey in this series has been a reminder to me just how amazing grace really is. How sweet the sound. It's a a reminder of how much I need it. I'm I'm the world's biggest uh, U2 fan, which occurred to me lately is about one of the uncoolest things you could ever say. But there's this, this poet, Bono, lead singer, who was interviewed, and, uh, and he says, the, the thing that keeps me on my knees is the difference between grace and karma. You see, at the center of all religions is this idea of karma. You know, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or in physics, every action is met by an equal or an opposite one. Karma is everywhere. And yet, he says, along comes this idea called grace to upend all that. Grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts, if you like, the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. I'd be in big trouble if karma was going to be my judge. I'd be in deep, and he says the word. It doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sin onto the cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. So may we too have the heart of God that cares for um, the wounded instead of shooting them. Uh, The spirit that restores those who have fallen that powerful force unleashed on this planet by Jesus himself. So powerful, it forgives, it saves, it restores, it transforms for all of eternity. And and today, um, as we end this series, we need to look at how we can take this amazing grace and kind of ruin it, screw it up, throw it on the ground and trample it, really. Make a mockery of it so that it's, it's... It's no grace at all. And to do that, I want to turn back to the story we looked at last week. Um, So so let me read that story again and make sure we camp out on something that a lot of people uh, don't camp out on. And it's found in John's biography of Jesus in the New Testament. And uh, this is what it says. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? He straightened up and said to them, if any one of you is without sin, 
Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time until only Jesus was left standing with the woman. Jesus asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. It's a, it's a remarkable story of grace. And uh, the Bible's very clear that she was indeed caught in the act. They had witnesses, plural. She, she was guilty. Here's what else we know. Um, because the penalty that was being uh, asked for was stoning, that tells us she was probably engaged to be married and was having sex with someone who was not her fiance because uh, that was actually the specific penalty for an engaged person who was unfaithful to their fiance. Unfaithful wives could also be sentenced to death, but the law did not specify how. So we have a good idea that, that um, she was engaged. Now, those of you who are engaged, you, you couldn't imagine that kind of hurt and betrayal. How devastating would that be? And, and while we acknowledged last week that there was a whole lot of suspiciousness going on here. Uh, it was probably a setup. Uh, yes, there's creepy Pharisees and creepy peeping Toms and men who are noticeably not being held accountable. Um, this woman is being victimized, but she's no victim. Uh, the sin is real. The hurt is real. Maybe you even know the hurt of adultery the kind of hurt that leaves kids without fathers and without mothers, the wives without husbands and vice versa. Um, a sacred covenant being broken. And so it's tempting to turn this woman into a complete victim. But you can't. Uh, she has, according to Jesus, uh, a life of sin, which might indicate, we don't know, but it might indicate that this was a, a pattern of conduct for this woman. A woman who has some blame in wrecking at least one home. And, and maybe some of you have felt that way. Oh, I was set up. Uh, my friends handed me too much to drink. My friends handed me the, the keys to the car. That guy really came on strong. And all of that may be true. Maybe we were set up, but on some level... We, we willingly participate in our sin. And, and we have to take responsibility for that. So this is a woman who has been wronged and sinned against, but she, she's not an innocent victim. So what did Jesus do? What did he say? His words ha have become legendary. Let me read them again. If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And no one did. Because no one was. And Jesus rejected a, a judgmental um, condom, condom, no, I should, I should finish that word. <laughs> uh, con condemning, condemning spirit. <laughs> Add it to the blooper reel. It's uh, about an hour and a half long now. And um, he replaced all that with grace. He didn't, he didn't see her through the lens of sin. He saw her in a different way. Everyone but Jesus saw a woman caught in adultery. And they saw her as a moral failure, someone deserving of condemnation and death. But through the extension of grace, Jesus saw a precious child of God, created in the image of God, someone who was a struggler in life and who had made many mistakes. Someone just like us. Someone just like me. But he also saw someone who could become the person that God intended. So after telling everyone else that they have no basis for condemning her, he, he added these words, then neither do I condemn you. And, and that's what we focused on last week. But there's one more thing he said and, and he also said words um, that give context to grace. 
words that we, we've got to get down or we won't get grace. And they were the final words he said to her in verse 11. Go now and leave your life of sin. Simple, clear, unequivocal. He said, turn from this life that you led up until this moment because you're not innocent. Turn from it. See see it for what it is, that that you've been rescued from the penalty of sin. And so live like it. And you see, to get grace right, it turns out you have to get truth right. Grace and truth, they go together. They are inextricably intertwined. You, you, you take away truth, you don't have grace anymore. I suppose you can have truth without grace, but you can't have grace without truth. And so Jesus accepted this woman as someone who mattered to him, but never did he affirm the way she had lived. Jesus didn't condemn her for what she did, but he didn't condone it either. He didn't just brush it off with a wink. This is important. Some people think that if you're, if you're going to show grace, that means you ignore sin. And, and you look the other way. You just accept it. Don't say anything negative against it. Don't, don't give consequences for it. If you did, that wouldn't be showing grace. Folks, that's what we call cheap grace. You look at the opening words from the New Testament biography of, of Jesus that John wrote. These are the opening words, and, and it's important to get down. It says, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Grace and truth together. He comes to our defense when we're just a bunch of stone throwers trying to, trying to kill each other. But he's also the first one to tell us to Stop cheating on your taxes. Stop ignoring the poor. Stop talking to your spouse that way. That's what Jesus is talking about. Grace and truth. Henry Cloud is a Christian psychologist who I greatly admire. And he said, truth is what is real. It describes things how they really are. Truth without grace is just judgment. But grace without truth is just deception. So, so let's dig into this. And to dig in, I, I want to look at two other passages in the Bible just real quick. The first is in the, the New Testament book of Romans, which is the Apostle Paul's great theological manifesto. And in chapter 6, here's what Paul writes. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, this is terribly important. Here's, here's what was floating around in Paul's day, and, and dare I say, maybe in 2023 as well. People were thinking, if my sin means that I need forgiveness, and I find that forgiveness through the grace of God that flows from Christ, then is my relationship with sin now changed, meaning that it's, it's, no, big, it's no big deal? I mean... As long as I ask for forgiveness, I'm forgiven, right? So, so why not just sin away? I sin, I get forgiveness. I sin, I get forgiveness. So once I'm in Christ, sin is no longer an issue. I can relax about it. In fact, if you think about it, uh, the more I sin, the more grace gets to work. I'm kind of doing God a favor, really. And, and, and so why not just sort of have at it? I think every Christian has maybe been tempted uh, with this line of thinking at one point or another. You know, the, the Catholic in us might secretly think, heck, I'll just settle it at confession next week. Or the Protestant in us might think, you know, I'll get this covered in evening prayers, uh, no harm, no foul. And to that, Paul says, 
Are you crazy? What are you thinking? That's like saying, okay, uh, now I'm married, and I, and I got my, my piece of paper, my certificate that says I'm married, and so now I can, uh, I can sleep with whoever I want since I, I have this marriage thing covered. As long as I come home to my spouse at the end of the day, uh, ask them to forgive me and make sure they know that I'm willing to stay married to them, um, if I do that, you know, what does it matter? Anybody think that's what marriage is all about? That's crazy, isn't it? And notice how Paul phrased his response. He said, we died with Christ. We were raised with Christ. Our baptism symbolizes um, our entrance into a new life, our embrace of that new life. A new life purchased at a great cost, by the way. And so to refuse to try and live that new life, to refuse to give ourselves to that new life and the new commitments um, would be to degrade and dishonor everything that relationship is about, everything that relationship stands for, and everything that Christ did for us in order to have it. So this isn't about a mandate to live a sin-free life as though that were even possible. But a mandate not to lead a sin-dominated life, uh, one where you kind of just give yourself over to it. Um, Even to the point of saying, ah, it doesn't even matter. Or, Or worse yet, ah, it's not even sin. There's a name for that. Cheap grace, which is no grace at all. I didn't coin that phrase. Let me, let me tell you about a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm going to give him the floor for a minute. Bonhoeffer was a, was a German Lutheran pastor uh, who, who, during the time of the Third Reich, worked underground uh, in the resistance against Hitler. Just put his, his picture up there. And he was eventually captured and then executed in a Nazi camp, and he wrote this great book called *The Cost of Discipleship*, one of the one of the Christian classics. And in it, he talks about this idea of cheap grace. And here's some of his words: He says, "Cheap grace is the deadly enemy of our church. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, the the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace without price, grace without cost." Through such grace, the world finds a cheap covering for its sins. No contrition is required, still less any real desire to be delivered from sin. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without the justification of the sinner. Cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. But real grace, he says, is costly. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And above all, it's costly because it cost God the life of his son. Cheap grace, he says, is Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ, which is no Christianity at all. So what, it, what does this all practically mean? Let, let's go to that second passage, a case study from the New Testament um, between the Apostle Paul and this church in Corinth. It's kind of a cheap grace incident, if you will. And the incident, as you'll see, will become uh, disturbingly clear. And I'm, let me just read it. And uh, I can hardly believe, Paul says, the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Even though I'm not with you in person, I am with you in the spirit. And as though I were there, I've already passed judgment on this man. In the name of the Lord Jesus, you must throw this man out. Don't you realize that this sin is like little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy 
or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid all those people. I meant that you're not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in such sins. Don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. So someone in the church is engaging in sexual sin, and it's the kind where even the irreligious people in town are going, gross, dude, icky. The perverts in town are like, dude, you've crossed the line. And, and this was a, a, a supposed Christian man who was unwilling to repent, unwilling to say it was wrong, even flaunted it. And I would say, if you want to be insulated and protected from these kinds of stories, don't become a pastor. Um, I have seen with, seen and dealt with some some crazy stuff. A spouse who's leaving ads for consensual hookups on a Kijiji-like message board, having them meet at her house. Uh, Someone else on on an old worship team who has a link sent to them because their spouse is found on this creepy BDSM website where you can chat and hook up. And people who at some point made a cognitive dissonance decision and justification that they could do that sort of thing and represent Christ in the world. And, and people will make a choice against the moral will of God. And once they make that choice, they often can go in one of three directions. They either can repent, they can flee, or often they harden their hearts. Those that repent have their heart break over what they've done. They seek forgiveness. They seek reconciliation. But then there are those who run away. And and they don't want to stop what they're doing. And they don't want to have to face consequences uh, for what they've done. so, So they flee the church. The, the people in the church, they flee their small group community and sometimes even their, their closest friends and family. They run away from the responsibility and the accountability and they have too much pride to come clean about their sin and their weakness. It makes the idea of church discipline and, and restitution almost a joke in this day and age where people can just kind of get up and leave and find a new church where they can sort of start again, no harm, no foul, other than, of course, the mess they left at the old church. And, and then maybe worst of all, there are those who harden themselves. They harden their heart. And I, I fear that they put their souls in the most danger of all. Because what they do is make a choice for disobedience. And, and they know it's wrong, but instead of repenting or even running away, in their heart, it's like they turn hard and they say, don't you tell me what's wrong. Don't you judge me. And, and they get militant and they get mean-spirited and defiant about their choice. I've seen it in personal relationships, good friends. I don't know how they got from point A to point B, but one day you find out they're flagrantly cheating on their wife. Years of relationships are just abandoned overnight. Um, If there isn't blame on others for their own sin, they're saying things like, well, if there is is such a, a thing as a God, and if there's a hell... I guess I'm going to burn in hell because I don't really care. What a scary place to be. I'll I'll bet you've seen it too. People who have made decisions to follow Christ, but when the guilt, the conviction comes, they, they shut down that piece of their heart. They turn cold and rebellious and seem to take the philosophy that bad is good, uh, wrong is right, and become almost boastful 
in their choice. That's what Paul's writing to the Corinthians about. But not just that, the church had so screwed up grace that they they thought the only thing real grace called for was approval, acceptance, ignorance, just kind of sweeping it under the carpet, pretending that nothing was happening. And the Apostle Paul didn't feel that way. He was swift and to the point. Let me read these words again in verse 2. You should be mourning in sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Now, we don't like words like this. I don't like words like this. But the alternative is to make the church's reputation a joke, to sully the reputation of Christ. Maybe worst of all, to fail to act would be to to trample on the very cross of Christ, to make a mockery of it. I want to be clear. Listen to me. We need to have all the time, all the love, all the acceptance for those who don't know Christ. We we are not to judge those in the world. Um, Why would we hold them to some standard of Jesus when when they don't know Jesus? It's ridiculous. Just love them. Would you do that? Love them. But, but, we are called to make honest assessments of ourselves and of each other's who claim to know Jesus, hold each other accountable for those who are in this, this household of faith, brothers and sisters. And if someone claims to be a Christ follower and just is flagrantly parading a life that dishonors Christ, then we're to stand up for the reputation of Christ. Paul says that, you know, we're not to actually socialize with with them, not while they're in that rebellious state, because it sends the message that you you sanction this blatantly unchristlike behavior. Someone leaves their husband and enters into a fair, and you you go out for dinner with them and laugh together as a new couple, really? There's not truth in that. There's not accountability. They, they've got to know that if you claim to be associated with Christ, then we, we can't just kind of wink and nod at that stuff. Here's what we need to get. Grace is like a, a band-aid in that it, it's meant to be applied to something. But make sure you understand that it's not to be applied to sin. Are you sure, Pastor? Yes. Grace is to be applied to repentance. Okay? It's applied to remorse. It's applied to someone who screws up but admits that they screwed up. Uh, for someone who doesn't, who, who flagrantly flaunts their sin, grace doesn't apply to that. Grace is not about sort of getting off the hook for whatever you want to do. Grace is not about never having to feel the sting of having hurt others or hurt God. There was this, it just came to me, this movie in the 70s, Love Story, Ryan O'Neill, and Tate, no, Tatum, wait, who? Ryan O'Neill and the, no, not Barbara Streisand. Who? Ellie McGraw. Ellie McGraw, very good, okay. Now, who directed that, no. Um, <laughs> the big, does anybody remember the, the famous line from that movie? Love means never having to say you're sorry. What? (laughs) Grace is not about sweeping things under the carpet. Grace is about accepting someone who says they are in Christ when they are uh, living a way that shames Christ and they ask for repentance and they make a turnaround. You know what a truly repentant person is willing to do? They're willing to do whatever it takes to make things right. Uh, I've seen spouses caught in affairs who, for all intents and purposes, seem sorrowful until you ask them to stop working with that person or um, stop going to the gym where you met this person that you slept with. And then there's all kinds of reasons why that won't work. 
And you ask them to include others in their confession, others who have been affected by their actions, and they won't do that. There's all kinds of reasons why they won't submit to that kind of accountability um, because, you know, they, they don't want to share their phone password or let other people look at their calendar. And I don't know if millennials still say this, but it's sort of like, sorry, not sorry, right? So be careful when you say, um, well, I sin too, so who am I to judge? That's not what this is about. There are, are things we are sp- supposed to be discerning about. There are things that we are, no matter how sin-stained we are, the church is to look at it and take a stand against for the sake of Christ. Sin is never to be embraced and affirmed in the name of grace. That is cheap grace, which is no grace at all. So there is an aspect of grace we have to get right. I I think the closest way I can illustrate this, um, y'all know the difference between a a lamb and a pig? Let's say a lamb and a pig find themselves in a mud hole. For whatever reason, they both end up in the same mud hole. And someone says, look at that lamb. It's supposed to be a lamb, but it's in the mud like a pig. Same mud, same incident, same problem, same weakness, same struggle different nature. How can you tell the difference between a lamb and a pig? They're both muddy now. That white fluffy lamb is all muddied up. They look just the same because when you get in the mud, you can't tell the difference from one another. Mud is mud. Sin is sin. I don't care who it is. But if you want to determine the difference between the lamb and the pig, remember when the pig gets in the mud, what does he do? He wallows. And when the lamb gets in the mud, he cries. When a, when a sincere Christian finds he has displeased God in some way, they are, they are either weeping in their prayer life, their, their time alone with God. Bah, I'm a sinner. Bah, Lord, please. Bah. And the miracle is not just how God gets you out of the mud, but also how, how you begin to feel about the mud. Because there was a time, oh, you would have been wallowing around in and all up that mud, but now it's, bah, you're, you're a new creature now. If you cry out to God, the Bible says that he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. I'm not the same person I used to be, bah. I used to be able to cuss people out and brag about it, but now, bah, bah. Uh, and some of you can't even hardly admit there's anything wrong with you because that would be too vulnerable and too real. But for the rest of us, bah, we know we need some grace. We realize that we, we need to be changed by God. Bah. Oh, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Grace for the repentant addict. Grace for the confessing abuser. Grace for the the prideful and the hypocritical and the angry. Grace for the slave trader. The lowest of the low, a man named John Newton, whose heart was gotten a hold of by God, who gave up the slave trade, repented, worked for for years with people like... um, William Wilberforce, to to actually crusade against slavery. And he wrote his first song, an autobiographical song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I don't know if there's any other former or current wretches in the room like me. Or if it's, or if it's, if there's any other muddied lambs, bah, that grace is available to you this morning. And it's so amazing.